I, could, I like to blame the baby Jesus for everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Fishing is bad. I guess it's Jesus' fault. <laughs> Welcome to the Fish Nerds. It's the latest about fish, fishing, and eating fish. It's usually funny, always interesting, and mostly true. I'm Karen from Karen Tablet Art, and here are the nerds. I'm Dave. And I'm Clay. Anything is fair game. It's a good bet that we have already broken our fishy New Year's resolutions for 2016. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I tend to break resolutions pretty quickly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, isn't that nice? <laughs> it is nice. I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd give us a little background music. You're doing a great job, Dave. Thank you. Uh, while that's playing, why don't you tell us about your big resolution for 2016? I would say that my fishy resolution for 2016 would be, you know, I I would like to fish outside the watershed. I should just make an effort to get out of the Northeast, even if I have to take a special trip. I want to get out of this watershed and get into something more that's in the, like, Mississippi drainage. That's a good resolution. Thank you. And for a hermit like you, a real challenge. <laughs> it is a challenge. <laughs> yeah, that that's true. But uh, still, it's something I'd like to do. Yeah, good. I would. I, for me, I would like my kids to actually like fishing and not tolerate it. <laughs> oh, you may be. Yeah, I think your days are numbered, if you ask uh, me. Yeah. I, I, you know, I took my kids to see Star Wars the other night. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, my wife on the way in the theater, she goes, you know, Zoe's only going because she knows you really want to see this movie, but she has no interest. And she's just wanted me to know that. <laughs> and, and then at the one big scene, uh, which I'm not going to spoil for those few people who haven't seen the movie yet. Sure. Uh, she started screaming and crying, and I had to leave the movie. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's that's how fishing is too. That that'll that'll <laughs> teach you. Yeah, my kid yeah. my kid was tolerant of it all the way up to, you know, like twelve or thirteen, and then she was like, you know, I'm tired of getting wet because no matter what we did, she ended up coming home like wet, and yeah. she was like, I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so and, and and you know who wants to fish with a thirteen year old. <laughs> well, I, I enjoy it. I went ice fishing with her maybe when she was 14, something like that. And that was awesome. Uh, but she just, you know, she's just like, yeah, done it. I'm right. fine. I'm cool. But she'll cycle back when she gets older. She'll cycle back to it. She uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, she will. Yeah, we'll see. Or she'll tell stories about it and re- have good memories about it. Yeah, that, that'll be it. You know, but, but the future is going to be kind of, you know, Mad Max kind of thing. There won't be any water anymore. Oh, yeah, but Mad Max is bitching. I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> People, uh, you know, anglers will just be dirt fishermen, you know. That's awesome. Big yeah. dirt fish. Ah! <laughs> uh, so anyway, what, what is your uh, resolution for 2016? I thought I just told you. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Teach my kids to like things. <laughs> you know, my resolution is to have a short-term memory. Good. We win. <laughs> Can I have, I mean, my resolution is for other people to do stuff. It's not really my resolution. Yeah, I know. That doesn't count. That that I've, that was my point. You, do, you haven't really made anything that would be, you know, you. Right, my, my fishy resolution, uh, I would like to fly fish more. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, it just point. so happens on the show tonight, we'll, there's a uh, fly fishing story that we can talk about in Fish in the News. Perfect. Uh, also on the show tonight, uh, some new nerds. Oh, I love new nerds. New nerds are the best. And it's fun to say. <laughs> new nerds from California. They'll be on later on the show, so be sure to catch that. Perfect. Good. Well, let's get on with it. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, uh, man. Too warm even for Santa, Dave. <laughs> really? Yeah, so we've here in the Northeast, we've had an unusually warm winter, mm-hmm. like crazy warm. Mm-hmm. Uh, not just like a little bit warm, but really warm. Like day before Christmas, it was like 60 degrees. I know, it's it's the child. That's the one that's doing it. The child? The child. I, I don't know what that means. El Nino. Oh, I thought you meant the baby Jesus. Well, I think that's, that's El Nino. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I like to blame the baby Jesus for everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Fishing is bad. I guess it's Jesus' fault. <laughs> well, you never hear it in sports, you know, when, like, somebody catches the winning touchdown. They always mm-hmm. go, oh, thank Jesus, thank my mom, thank, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Nobody ever, like, blames Jesus. Right. You know, it's like, oh, you dropped the football on the one-yard line. Yeah, Jesus made me do it. Damn but it. they do. <laughs> Like they stub their toe? Jesus Christ. I suppose so. I suppose right? they do. But they don't blame the baby Jesus. And I and we are specifically blaming the baby. Yeah. Well, it's the kid. Yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, El Nino this year has caused a heat wave out in the Northeast. Crazy warm. So uh, there's, a, there's a local pond up in Tamworth, New Hampshire that I fish usually early December for trout. Uh, and this year it hasn't froze yet. And here it is now coming into January, and it's still water, still liquid. I guess ice is water. <laughs> yes. <But laughs> <laughs> it's still water. It's still liquid. Uh, so uh, Christmas Eve, my daughter Zoe and I put on waders and went out and tried to catch a trout. The goal was she really wanted me to catch a trout and dress like Santa and put the trout in my lap and ask it what it, what it wanted for Christmas. <laughs> That was the photo shoot. She was in charge of the camera and all the props and everything. So we brought all the stuff down to the pond with us, and we were ready to catch fish. Uh, And uh, we got in the water, and even with waders on, it was cold. Mm, Wow. So I'm in the water, got my Santa beard and hat on. She's on shore with the tripod taking photos and laughing at me. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I, I, we put about an hour in. I got nothing. Then she went out to try it. And now she's borrowing my wife's hip waders. Mm. Now, my daughter's eight years old. And the waders are huge on her. And as she's walking out, she's yelling, Dad, I'm floating. And her feet keep floating up. Oh, jeez. She's not even heavy enough to keep the waders down? That's right. Yeah. So she's <laughs> laughing her, her, you know, her butt off. And oh, wow. I was nervous about her falling in. But, you know, I figured she'd live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, waders yeah. are a wonderful thing for kids because you, you feel bulletproof in waders. You, you know? really do. They're pretty amazing. They are, yeah. And, yeah, you don't care about leeches. You don't care, you know, we don't care about no stinking leeches. Yeah. Uh, so we were fishing. A friend of mine gave a tip that he was down there fishing using power bait, not a technique I normally use. Mm. I actually don't like waiting for fish. <laughs> I usually like to cast around and go find the fish. And for, for those listeners that are not in the region or not in a trouty area, can you explain what power bait is? Yeah, I'm not sure what power <laughs> bait is. It comes in a little jar uh, with fluorescent colors. Uh-huh. Uh, it's really gooey and gross, and you make a little ball of it and stick it over a tiny hook and put it in the water. And in theory, a trout will come eat it. Right. So that's the, that's the goal. Uh, and I haven't had much luck recently. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so that, so that didn't work, but uh, it's a right. Berkeley product, by the way. It is a Berkeley product, and it's uh, you know a good product, but um, you know when you if you're going to catch and release, it's not a great thing to be using, right? Because they they do like to just gulp it right down. They do, they suck it down, uh, but it is effective, and a lot of people that's their go-to trout bait. Yeah, it's it's sort of like fish flavored play doh, sort of, mm, sort of, and all the any color you can imagine, they probably have it in. Mm-hmm. So maybe next time I should make like different shapes out of it and see what shape attracts the fish oh yeah like you know like the the monster play-doh machine when you were a kid yeah play-doh fun factory yeah yeah exactly yeah so like get the little tube out and like make a star shaped one yeah 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 and you know you roll it out make a little pancake and yeah, yeah with a little blue knife i can cut out whatever shape i want yeah 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 yeah. you should do that next time okay so not much of a story there, but we haven't fished in so long or told a fishing story in a long time. I thought I would try something, and uh, there's no ending. <laughs> there's nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. Well, at least you got out. I didn't even I didn't even attempt to go out over the holidays. Uh, we need some cold weather. We, we need something. We need something. Mm-hmm. Although I know some people are fishing. There's a few rivers up here in uh, New Hampshire that are open for fly fishing during the winter. Well, here's the news, Dave. This show is airing after January 1st. Yes. And that means the rivers are all open now. Oh, they it, open yeah, right sure. at January 1st? That's right. Oh, so I could go out to a river and, and go fishing? Yeah. Huh, I did not know that. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, they just close up so that the fish can spawn and they reopen again. The fish that don't spawn so they can spawn? Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> most of the trout that are put 
uh, in New Hampshire actually don't successfully spawn. I don't know if it's most. You, you hear people that they have pockets where some of the rainbow trout spawn. and Yeah, I find it suspect, but I'm, people are talking about it. I know, but for the most part, they don't, they don't spawn. Right. Um, but anyway, no, I guess the brook trout, I guess in theory, they're trying to protect those spawning populations. I think that's right. Um, all right, then. That's it. The end. Fishing with Santa. <laughs> oh, oh, stinking ho. Ho, ho. I'll tell you what, though. That Santa beard, totally warm. <laughs> I may ice fish with it a few times this winter. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, he's he's from up north. He would know. He would know, indeed. So stay tuned for lots of Santa beard pictures this winter coming up at Fish Nerds on Facebook. And you'll get them. OPC. Old pickled children. <laughs> Old squaw people salad. Mm, people salad. That's an S. Oh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How about outdoor podcast channel? Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. We are founding members of the OPC, Dave. That's true. We are. Uh, the OPC is one uh, one RSS feed, one iTunes feed, one Stitcher feed, where you can get eight outdoor shows a week. That's more than one a day. And we're talking the Big Buck Registry, Bow Dudes, Bow Hunting Freedom, Hunt Fish Travel, Take Aim, The Green Way, The Turkey Hunter, Up North Journal, and Where to Hunt Podcasts. Right. Almost all hunting shows. Yeah, I know. What are we doing in there? Well, uh, we're the funny guys. <laughs> I guess so. We're, we're the guys who get the iTunes reviews that say, maybe you ought to have a language disclaimer up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Just maybe. Just maybe. We're those guys. Yeah. So Well, anyway, uh, we're up there. Uh, yeah, we're there. So anyway, if you want other outdoor shows uh, and you want to get them all in one place, go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from and look for the Outdoor Podcast Channel today. I love Fish in the News. <laughs> I know you love Fish in the News. Uh, this week, we have an appropriate, since it's the end of the year, the holiday season. Um, this comes from 7 News, WSPA.com. Uh, and that is somewhere out in the Midwest somewhere. I'm not even sure where it's from. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, you can find these stories all over the place. The headline reads, Sink Your Christmas Tree and Save Hartwell Fish. That's awesome. Yeah, so Hartwell. I, I like where this is going. <laughs> it says, don't throw away your Christmas tree. There is a way to put your tree to good use that is environmentally friendly, according to the Corps of Engineers. Mm. Uh, the They say, the Corps, that which, which first of all, it kills me that there is a Corps of Engineers. <laughs> you know, they're like a, a bunch of guys with protractors, <laughs> all that march in a line and have, you know, tanks and stuff. The Corps. I love it. Yeah. It's like Marine Corps, Corps of Engineers. Um, anyway, the Corps of Engineers says Christmas tree <laughs> sinking is helping Lake Harwell, Hartwell, sorry, all year long. It is as much a tradition as it is environmentally friendly, according to the story. For decades, the Corps of Engineers has been collecting Christmas trees to sink in Lake Har Hartwell they say it makes the fish happy. And I, I believe that. The fishermen. Really? Sure. Well, if fish can be happy, <laughs> if that's a thing. <laughs> well, according to the story, small organisms, and this is a quote, small organisms get in there. And the baby fish, they basically live in there trying to stay away from predators. And in turn, the predators stay around them, said Jess Fleming of the Corps of Engineers. I like Jess Fleming. Very well researched. <laughs> you know, they, they, they get in there. They, they just get right on in there. And little things are eaten by the bigger things who are eaten by the bigger things who in turn hang out waiting for the littler things. <laughs> the story says those predators are game fish like bass and crappie, uh, making the area around these sunken trees a fisherman's haven. Uh, I definitely believe that to be a true thing. Mm. Fleming said they see between 250 and 500 trees donated each year. 
Wow. Local fishermen can pick up what they want to re wait, wait. Local fishermen can pick up what they want to reuse, then the core binds the rest and oh and sinks them in the prime fishing locations around the man made lake in Georgia and South Carolina. Oh, so that's where we're talking. Old tree de- uh, old trees, guess how long it takes for a Christmas tree to decompose in Georgia and South Carolina? Mm, uh, 10 years. Mm, three to five years. Mm. Yeah, so fairly quickly. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. And then it goes on. It says, it's more than just fish friendly. It's economic insurance. Mm-hmm. Insurance, huh? The latest Corps of Engineers report estimates 3 million visits each year for fishing, about one third of all lake use. That represents a potential economic impact of $156 million to the region per year. That's amazing. That is amazing. But there seems to be a flaw there. So, all right. So I picked this story because this is often the case where they will say, you know, bring out your Christmas tree and sink it for, you know, for the good of the fish. <laughs> um, so I... I've heard rumors that it doesn't actually improve fish populations. And I I checked out uh, a fisheries journal. Fisheries is what it's called. And there was an article in 2002, The Use of Artificial Habitat Structures in U.S. Lakes and Reservoirs Mm -hmm. by Kimberly Turgeon and Michael Allen and Mark Webb. They're they're known for this, you know. They're experts. Right. Uh, And they basically said... They surveyed uh, a bunch of lake managers down in the southeastern part of the United States, and most of them said it there was minimal effects. And uh, on increasing the population or making fishing better? Both. Really? Yes. They, they said fish abundance or angler catch rates were both mm. sort of meh. meh. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe it. <laughs> Well, it's certainly – I don't think it improves the number of fish because – No, I, w- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that. But let's say you have a lake – like some of the lakes up in New Hampshire, they're just big bowls of sand. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine if you had a brush pile, a bunch of Christmas trees, you'd have habitat and fish move in. So I don't think you have more fish you know, in the lake, but I think they'd all kind of get closer together or hide out in those structures. And But, but I don't know. Now you have something to snag. True. You know, and, yeah. and, and and then also in my experience, people aren't that effective at fishing deep water like that. No. Um, well, if you – I find ice fishing, it would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Although you go out and dump them and you, you forget where they are. <laughs> well, so. well, but now with modern technology, you shouldn't be forgetting it. You should be marking it on your GPS and you know exactly. Exactly where it is. And in New Hampshire, wasn't the state record crappie caught uh, – allegedly on a man-made brush pile? All I know is caught in the Bellamy Reservoir. I don't know if it was on one of those brush piles. Well, I'm alleging. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. That it was caught on a brush pile. Now, this is really interesting, though, because we're all inclined to go out and do this type of thing. Mm. And what's the rule in New Hampshire, Dave? Can you go out and make a brush pile like that? I don't think so. No. <laughs> You will get, you will be in trouble. <laughs> you will be in trouble. Although I know people sneak out and do it. Well, there, I'm, I'm sure there's very little or no enforcement. Right. I mean, you can't have brush pile police. <laughs> yeah, you can you imagine going to jail? What are you in jail for? Eh, brush pile. Yeah. Now, I do know people who take, like, Christmas garland. So they, they drill holes all around their ice shanty, and they have these spooled up garland with little weights on the end, and they just drop them down these little holes. Hmm. And they fish all day around the garland, and they say that draws in the fish looking for habitat. Interesting. Now, I I happened this year, Dave, to pick up some garland in the after Christmas specials today, and I plan on trying it this winter. (laughs) Nice. Now, I wonder, you know, you think about all the multiple effects. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if fish actually congregate around those at a significant number that increases mm-hmm. catches or are people just a lot more careful around those because they think there are fish there right it's tricky because you hard to eliminate variables this is why fish science is so difficult when you're talking about fishing mm, yes because there's so many variables to play in maybe you fish differently because the garland is there maybe you fish longer in one spot because the garland is there right right um you know there's a lot of different maybe 
that day there's more fish there because the air pressure is different or whatever. Well, and the other the other thing that they're not counting for, both in the Christmas tree uh, sinking department with the Corps of Engineers or your garland technique, is you're assuming fish are Christian. Um, we live in a Christian nation. <laughs> but maybe they're Jewish. America. But if they're but if they're like another religion, if they're druids, they're not going to be, <laughs> you know, hip on that. That's true. We have to drop like rocks down, right? In a, a circle-y pattern, stacked up funny. Right, exactly. Mm. And that would do it. Yep. Um, or if they're Muslim, you could you could fish to the east in the mornings. <laughs> you can, you can. I have, I have no idea how to even have this conversation. <laughs> You're just trying not to get in trouble. I'm working real hard. <laughs> I know it's okay to make fun of Christians, <laughs> but I don't, and and atheists, right. but I don't know the rest of the rules. Yeah, it's probably not okay to make fun of any of anybody. What? Well, it's no, it's probably not. No, you know, it's religion. People people get very sensitive about that. But religion. I always thought you could make fun of things that you have been or are. <laughs> I don't think that's a good. rule. That's not a rule. No, because oh, <laughs> that doesn't work either. Oh well. Um, but uh, that's fish in the news for sinking Christmas trees. I think it's just a conspiracy to get rid of old Christmas trees. I think so. We we know we we have a neighbor with goats. Mm. We just bring our tree to the goats. Oh, that's smart. Yep. We uh we have a brush pile in our backyard. It it sucks for fish. You can't get any fish there. But no, but good for practice snagging. <laughs> it's true. It is Perfect. true. Um, the next thing on Fish in the News comes from Field and Stream Magazine, their blog. And the title is Take the Leap, Five Reasons to Start Fly Fishing in 2016. That's my resolution. I know. That's what I was saying in the beginning yeah. of the show. Uh, and I just wanted to run by these five reasons to see if you agree. All right. I'm listening. All right. So reason one says fly fishing is not expensive. Uh, hmm. hmm. Okay. So expensive <laughs> is relative, right? Right. So it says you will not, uh, you can get a setup which costs around $200. Right. That's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. The very definition of expensive right there. <laughs> no, they're saying you don't have to spend thousands. You can spend $200. Uh, on a fishing rod. Well, no, that's the whole reel. That's, that's everything. Right, that's expensive. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. My first, my first fly set for Morvis was two hundred dollars. Had the whole combo deal. Yeah, I, and I think mine was too. And it looked beautiful. Yeah, they're yeah. very, very nice. My second one cost thirty five dollars. I'm not going <laughs> to tell you where I bought it. <laughs> uh, so that's that's one. So you think number uh -huh. one not true? Bullshit. Bullshit. Yep. Okay. Number two, the trout fishing is great right now. And so the writer says, no, I'm serious. People always talk about what this river used to be like or that lake used to fish the lights out of. I don't know what that means. Um, but in my honest opinion, the quality of trout fishing opportunities coast to coast is, on balance, better than it was 20 years ago. I would say that's likely. Hmm. Mm hmm I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I've had I – I mean, it's the same. I don't, I've always had an easy time catching trout except fly fishing. Right. Well, but they've been stock fly fishing is the hard way to catch a trout. <laughs> it's the hard way to catch trout, and you know he's a trout bias. You know you don't need to ca even catch trout if you're fly fishing. Right. Uh, but I suppose they've been stocking fish forever, and I suppose stock fishers, yeah, whatever. Um, I would say though, native trout numbers are down. If I had to. Uh, well, in New Hampshire, they don't even use the word native anymore. It's just wild. Yeah, wild trout. Because the numbers are just non-existent. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to say debatable on number two. Uh, number three, fly anglers are not snobs. <clears throat> Bullshit. <laughs> and this guy says, no, no, there's, there's uh, you know, young, old men, women, plenty of kids covering all demographics and races. Uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, it's true, but they're all snobs. <laughs> <laughs> Equal opportunity snobbery. <laughs> right. I, I went to a fly fishing expo last year uh, with, as a fish nerd rep. Mm. Uh, and boy, first of all, the idea of catching multi species doesn't occur to them. Oh, right. Overall, it's just trout. Uh, and then the idea of eating anything, 
blows their minds. Blasphemy. Uh, and the fact that, you know, that that I'd rather catch a bass on a fly rod than a trout also makes them crazy. Mm, there you go. So yeah. Uh, so that's number uh, three. Mm-hmm. Number We're going to be offending our fans here. I know. Number four, fly fishing is not only about trout. Okay, there you go. Ah, well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, yes, there's... about 75% of gear sold for fly fishing in this country is for trout. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a, every single person who's reading this, no matter where you are, is within driving distance of a fish that can be caught on a fly rod. Uh, that's true. Yeah. But to say it's not about trout and they say 75% of sales are for trout— it's about trout. Yeah, for the most part. But, you know. Yeah, it's not saying it's like a 50-50 split. It's saying, eh, mostly trout, but eh, sometimes people catch other fish too. Right. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I'll give it that. I'll give them that one. That was a good one. Yeah. By the way, but, this. But, but fly fishing people are still, the, in where I live, that's the thing. Right. And so I need to get over my bias against fly angling and get in there. I have friends up here who fly fish. I have friends who are guides up here who fly fishing men. And uh, I'm hurting their feelings tonight. So. <laughs> Let me let me apologize on behalf of the fish nerds. We like all kinds of fishing, even if you're fly fisherman. <laughs> even. Despite the fact. Uh, number five, fly fishing will make you a better all-around angler. Maybe. <laughs> I think it would, if that's if that's inclusive of other kinds of fishing. Yeah, okay. If you're only a fly fisherman, I would say no. Mm. It makes you a really good fly fisherman. <laughs> right. But if you're already good at everything else and you add fly fishing in, which I'm planning on doing, then yes, I'll agree with that. Yeah, why not, huh? Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it seems that we're, we're about split on his recommendations. By the way, this is from Kirk Dieter, mm-hmm. Fly Talk article or um, column in Field and Stream. Good. We should get him on the show. Yeah, yeah, and just see. And defend himself. <laughs> All right, Kirk. Good day, sir. Hey, uh, Fish Nerds want to thank everyone who listened to our show in 2015 uh, and downloaded the show and told their friends about the show. And we need your, you guys to help us in 2016. Your resolution. Your Oh, thank you, Dave. Go ahead. Your 2016 resolution should be to head to iTunes or Stitcher and leave us a five-star review and a nice comment about the show. Uh, failure to do so means you're not a true fan, and you should never download the show again. <laughs> right. Yes. The end. We gotta lose our 12 listeners. We love our listeners, and one of the cool things about being a Fish Nerds fan is you get to be friends with the Fish Nerds. Uh, we bumped into two guys from California. When I say bumped into, we've never met them, but they found our show and then found us on Facebook, uh, and they were interesting and fish nerdy like you wouldn't believe, and they wanted to be part of the show. And so tonight, we're happy to introduce our two newest Fish Nerds correspondent. Uh, James Frank and Josh Porter. They're from the Oakland, California area. Uh, James uh, is known as Fish Friend James and Josh is Fish Guy Josh, both on Instagram if you want to find them. And this week they visit a hatchery in California and chat with kids about salmon spawning with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So here is their very first Fish Nerd story. So where are we, Josh? <laughs> We're at Gelston Field Office. And what are we doing? We're filling up a container to carry fish home in. What kind of fish are we going to get today? We're going to get black bullhead and brown bullhead. Why? Because we need them for the collection, and someone was nice enough to get them for us. 
On a burst camp morning in early December, fish guy Josh and I had an opportunity to visit some friends at the Nimbus Trout and Salmon Hatchery up in Rancho Cordova. It's about two hours north of our offices here in Oakland, California. The bullheads from our friends at UC Davis were just a side trip, and since we happened to be there on the second to last day of the salmon spawn, we figured we'd do this little piece for the nerds. Very cool. And I'm here with Laura Draft. She is an interpreter with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing right here? Right. So we've brought in a bucket full of fish that were out in our holding pool at the top of the ladder. They basically use a big crowder, a fence in the water to push the fish forward through a door into the hatchery building, into a tray. And then they apply electric shock so that the fish are knocked unconscious and that way they can handle them safely. What's the shocking situation like? These guys are all like standing here in, in boots and like they're all soaking wet and they survive this, all the guys that are working here? Oh, they love it. This is their favorite time of year. Yeah, um, it is a little brutal, but so is nature, right? So these fish, they're going to die anyway. It's the end of their life cycle. So, of course, Laura, being an educator, explains the whole thing about salmon going upstream to die and putting nutrients back in the system and all that wonderful stuff. And meanwhile, there's a group of school kids coming in. And I know Clay had his daughter go out and do this thing where she interviewed the kids at the local trout hatchery, which is really cool. And and this is my first time actually seeing all this stuff happen up close myself. Well, you know, there's fish being electrocuted, there's fish being bashed over the head and slit open, and it's just total mayhem behind the glass. And these kids were mesmerized. Their parents were mortified. It was it was a really cool thing to see. Let's hear a few things from those kids. All right, tell us your first name. Brooke. Brooke, that is an awesome name for being at a, at a trout hatchery, at a fish hatchery. Do you know why? No. Because that's where trout and salmon spawn in brooks. Did you know that that's like a thing? That's actually, a, like there's a thing called a brook trout. Did you know that? No. Well, there is a trout named a brook trout. That is really a great name to have. Okay, Brooke, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing today? We're seeing salmon that are being killed so they could get the eggs out. We have to kill salmon to get the eggs out of them? Why is that? I don't know. Oh, man. Well, I think they die when they, when they lay their eggs anyway. So this is kind of a way to make sure that all the eggs get fertilized and get turned into baby fish. Does that sound good? Yes. Who's this guy? What's your name? Um, Mason. Mason, why don't you tell me a bit, a bit about what you learned today so far? Um, well, it's kind of hard to remember because, like, you're getting all this cool-looking stuff in your head and kind of losing the information that you learned. I, I have that problem all the time, too. I have no idea. what I, I went to school for 12 years. Well, just in, in regular school. Let's, I went to school longer than that, but, but I don't even know what I learned. I don't, I don't remember any of it. Do you, um, do you have a favorite subject, Mason? Um, in school, P.E. That, is, that was also my favorite subject as well. That, yeah. Now, in Mason's defense, I have to say there was a lot going on, so I can totally understand that he had no clue what was happening. But it was pretty darn cool, and we got to go down on the floor uh, with Laura for a little while. Okay, so tell me what's going on. We are back on the floor, and we are witnessing some, some stinky things happening. Basically, uh, after the fish have been killed, they rinse all the blood out of the female's body and then open up the body cavity. And when they do that, about five to 6,000 eggs come spilling out. Um, they'll fertilize those. They go one-to-one, -one, one male to one female. They don't select um, which male. They just take the next one in line. See, that's pretty cool because I look at these fish and I think they look like wild fish. They look like they're actually really healthy compared to what I usually see with, like, farm-raised trout and things like that that are all sorts of messed up. So it seems like it's working pretty well. We'll only keep the salmon for about six months of their life. When they're little uh, fingerlings, we put them back into the river. So they really do live as wild salmon for the vast majority of their life and then just return to the river when they're ready to spawn. And as a result, they're eating that wild ocean diet. They're much more um, fit fish than a farmed fish would be. Gotcha. And so what is the reason for having to do this? Like, why, why do we have to actually take care of this process ourselves? 
So our hatchery is a mitigation hatchery. In the 1950s, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation built Folsom and Nimbus dams on the American River. And when they did that, they blocked access to the main spawning grounds for the salmon. They used to spawn upriver, and that whole area was blocked off to where they now only have about seven river, uh, river miles left for spawning in. It's not enough to maintain the kind of population we need to meet all the needs by the, both the wildlife and the commercial and sport fisheries. So we produce four million salmon every year to make up for what would have spawned above the dams. So you said seven miles is all they have left of what used to be, what, like hundreds of miles of streams? Yeah, I mean, the, the majority of these fish, which are fall-run salmon, would have spawned here and in the seven or so miles that are now covered by Lake Natoma, just above the dam. But we also used to have spring-run salmon on this river, and they would return in the spring and head all the way up into the mountains, and they would use, yeah, about 100 miles of river up in the foothills, and they completely lost access to that when the dams went in. That run is, is now extinct. Now, were those spring-run Chinook, or were they some, they were something else? Yeah, spring-run Chinook. That's the only the only salmon that comes up this river. Gotcha. Wow. Stump the fish nerds. Dave, it's been a long time since we've played Stump the Fish Nerds. It has been a long time, and just by dumb luck tonight, I was working on the show notes, and a call came in on the hotline, and I have normally we're not able to answer it directly. We never answer it. <laughs> and I, I picked it up, and the guy's like, oh, hi. And I'm like, oh, hi. And he's like, uh, this is Josh. Uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, is this Josh, like fish guy Josh? Um, I'm betting it was Josh Dogood. Oh, could be. I'm not sure, though. He sounded like he just came across us, never even heard of us, really. Really? Yeah. Well, cause, well, and it wasn't by pure chance. As I was on the Facebook page, and I posted our Stump the Fish Nerds hotline number and asked people to call in. Mm. So that's not chance. That's me making effort to get show good. <laughs> show good. Uh, show good. <laughs> uh, if you want to come on the show and play Stump the Fish Nerds with us, you can call 607-378-FISH. 607-378-FISH, leave a voicemail, we'll play it in the show and answer it, and I guess a very lucky few random callers get to talk to Dave live. <laughs> and I and go, hey, much. are you fish guy Josh? And he's like, oh, I'm, uh, I like fish. And I'm like, well, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I, I happen to know that fish guy Josh is in Hawaii right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, are you in Hawaii? In, in Hawaii? And he goes, uh, no. I'm like, well, you're, you're not that guy. So um, he is. He called himself fish, fish addict or fish, fish something. Yeah, his name is Josh Dugood. He posted just just now posted a message to us on our Facebook wall. So from Josh, the fish junkie, you guys are the best. Thanks for the airtime. Definitely Josh Dugood. Yeah, there you go, fish junkie. So, that's what he called himself. Yeah, and um, he had this question. Hi, my name is Josh, the fish junkie, and I would like to know what is the world's largest largemouth bass. All right, so what do you think? How big can a largemouth bass get? Which, well, at, at Lowe's this year, and I'm not making this up, they have an inflatable big mouth belly bass. At Lowe's? Oh, at yep. Lowe's. <laughs> yeah, at Lowe's hardware store, and it inflates to about eight feet long. <laughs> so I'm going to say eight feet. Nice. And it still sings. That's, that's important. Yeah. That, that's important. Um, I am Googling right now. I, mm -hmm. I thought it's from California. I always heard that some of the big giant deep lakes out there that they stock a bunch of rainbow trout. They end up getting super giant on these big rainbow trout. Um, but uh -huh. that, that was several years ago. I, I stopped paying attention after a while. But uh, world records, biggest largemouth bass. If you type that in, you get George Perry, which sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. um, caught. Oh, actually, that's. That's the official world record, 22.4 pounds. That's a big, gross bass. <laughs> That's a really big, gross bass. <laughs> um, but in 2000, somebody caught a 22-pound, 5-ounce. Oh, that's about, that's about the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, big, gross bass in the 20-pound range. Um, now this is weird. I yeah, I guess lucky lures isn't necessarily the the end all when it comes to. I'm reading here almost world record bass pulled from Lake Dixon, 25 pounds, one ounce. 
<laughs> that seems like it would be. But, it does seem like it. Uh, but it's not the world record because it was – oh, it was foul hooked. Ah, oh, um, almost. Yeah, so they, they hooked it in the head or something. But uh, so, so I guess the answer is 25 pounds. That's amazing. Yeah, that is. That is really amazing. Yeah, they look like little uh, big suitcases. They're really gross. Ish. It is funny how some fish, when they get big, they look beautiful. Mm. And others just don't. Like, like I, um, I, I've seen giant trout, mm. like huge brown trout pictures. And they just look like big, fat slobs. Mm. Yeah, I know. You know. It's just gross looking. They're, I mean, it would be fun to catch them, but man, are they yucky looking. Right. But, you know, like a big marlin or a big... Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful swordfish. Yeah. Beautiful tuna. Gorgeous. Yeah. Channel catfish. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that looks the same as a small one. Yeah. But like, but like, a, like a brown trout that's like 22 inches, mm -hmm. stunning. Mm. One that's 42 inches... Not so stunning. <laughs> I don't know. They're still pretty nice, but I know they're not. <laughs> so there you go, Josh. Fishing and hunting expo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> January 9th and 10th in beautiful Salem, New Hampshire. Doesn't Expo sound like something you might get in trouble for doing? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, here's a ticket for expoing yourself. <laughs> it just seems like, you know, former poage. I would, yeah, I mean, it does. I'm expo. <laughs> no, no, I'm not a po. I used to be a po. Now I'm an expo. Expo. Yeah, um, former po. But uh, this is a great show that actually, if you go to the RockinghamExpo.com, you will see um, on their slider, the fish nerds are right on the slider. We, we've we been generously given the first booth in the expo every year for the past couple of years. I think four years in now. I think so, too. And yeah, um, we, it's nice. We're right up there with, with a lot of other... Uh, Sort of famous things there. There's the Mountain Road Trading Post. Ooh, I know. never heard of them. They sound I, famous. They do sound famous. <laughs> and then there's the famous Tim Moore of Tim Moore Outdoors. And, uh, uh, as we know him as Tiny Tim Moore. <laughs> the Clam Crew will be there. I like those guys. Ice Team, I guess, is what they're called. They don't call themselves the Clam Crew, but they could. They could. And then Yankee Fleet is there. Berry Conservation Youth Camp is there. Cool. And uh, many, many others. I think the Wicked Tuna guy will be there. David Perry. Oh, we are on there, huh? On the slider. I'm on the website now. Yeah, there you go. And also On the Water Magazine's there. Sweet. Yeah. So, yeah, all of our friends will be there. This is a rare chance to see the Fish Nerds live. We don't do a lot of live appearances uh, due to Dave's hermitudes. <laughs> but uh, we will definitely be there um, showing off some... Some banners and it's fun. So come on, check us out for two days on January 9th and 10th at the Rockingham Expo in Salem, New Hampshire. Yeah, not many live live uh, presentations. I'm planning. I'm planning a big dead presentation tour uh, when I die. Right, but it's much stinkier. Well, a little stinkier. <laughs> it's a little yeah. stinkier. Just put me in a cooler, and you know, just like they do with the big fish uh, mm -hmm. that they have at those expos. Just put me in a cooler. Put ice yep. on me. I'll be fine. I noticed that the photo in the slider is like from our very first year there. <laughs> I think it is. It's pretty funny. Yeah. It's way outdated. <laughs> but, but hey, it, cool to be on the slider. Absolutely. So come out to the Fish and Hunt Expo January 9th and 10th in beautiful Salem, New Hampshire. Mm hmm So that is it. That's it. You have listened to a couple of fish nerds when you could have been fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that middle-aged guys do. If you would like to support the fish nerds, you can go to patreon.com and search for the fish nerds and help us crowdfund this show. Special thanks to the amazing James and Josh the Fish Guy for joining the fish nerds team. Welcome, welcome. Hmm. 
Smiles, everyone. Smiles. Yay, smiles. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. 